I think those of us who have an interest in disasters and disaster medicine, we know that pandemics happen, and this is our you know, one in a hundred years, once in a century, once in a lifetime pandemic, we hope. It was clear early that the greatest challenge in the COVID pandemic was going to be, and still is, in fact, uh, the human factor, the having people to do the jobs. And so we, we brought staff from all different directions and we, we created new systems uh, out of the blue. You would have orthopedic surgeons working in a COVID area, ophthalmologists working in a COVID area. We have surgeons working in the medical wards looking after COVID patients. And we, we had to pull resources from areas where people were outside of their, their comfort zone. Everybody was so anxious. People were scared. Uh, and I definitely wouldn't downplay that because it speaks to their level of dedication in staffing those units in the end. And I was one of the people who volunteered myself to come and then do the, the training. We tried to provide exactly the same level of intensity of the training and the same quality of the training to the intern, the nurse, the porter who came to the training as well as the professor. I had a professor of endocrine disease uh, who was standing next to me, who I'm fairly certain hasn't held a laryngoscope in 30 or 40 years, uh, and, and asking me, you know, you know, so how do I do this again? And, and, you know, preparing himself for the event that he would actually need to do it. Then we confirm that the, that the O2 is off. Before we took a lesson from people in the aviation industry who go through multiple checklists before they do something high risk. So then the hot three, you know, the roles were labelled hot one, two, three, and it could be anybody in those roles. Yeah, hot three's job is to do the checklist, give the drugs, and watch the monitor. We know from medical training and simulation material that if you level the playing field, if you flatten hierarchies, if you improve communications, you improve the outcomes, you improve the flow, you reduce errors. We had zero infections in the first two waves uh, on that team. Uh, and that's a testament just to the amount of rigor with which they did their work. Doing the degree of teaching and training around it and actually bringing people from really around the entire hospital, uh, which then spiraled out to being from other hospitals and you know, across the city and eventually the country. How's it been going at Rob Ferreira? We find it especially useful because we have rotating interns every two months. Um, so it's very useful to be able to disseminate videos which are you know, consistent from group For clarity, to group. HOT refers to all items. But it was very gratifying to start getting messages back uh, and occasionally you know, a picture of a, of a team in a theatre around a laptop with a video up on the screen uh, and you know, to see the uh, printouts of the, the guidelines and the checklists being used. Uh, I, I got queries out of Africa, out of Malaysia, uh, out of Indonesia where people had found this material. It was a great sense of support and um, containment. We had advice at the end of our WhatsApps and the end of our phones and computers. I like to say the only way you truly take ownership of knowledge is to give it away. It made a greater sense of community. You didn't feel quite like a, the ship you know, lost at sea. It was quite critical in order to just keep going, going forward. We, we made mistakes or we've learned things about uh, COVID particularly, but what we put out there initially was the best that we had. And, and really the way in which we learned together was inspiring. The medical doctors, the anaesthetists, the surgeons, the nurses. Um, and as we speak, we've got a ward full downstairs on seafloor. We're waiting to fill up the next unit and we'll do it all over again because that's what we're trained to do.